Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming to this webinar on detecting bots on Twitter. I'm Kevin. I'm the head of developer relations at Bit, and today we're going to go over uh, how you can detect actual bots on Twitter. Before we head into um, the nitty gritty, let's first go over some vocabulary and definitions. So first of all, what actually are bots? What defines the term bot? A bot is short for a robot. A bot is essentially an independent functioning program that you can actually program to interact with online users. So for example, a bot on Twitter would be an account run by a non-human program, tweeting, liking, and retweeting posts. And oftentimes as humans, it's Oftentimes, as humans, it's really, really hard to um, tell actually who is a bot and who is not a bot. So it's, it would be really useful for us to actually detect who is a bot on Twitter. Before we do that, let's go over some key Python concepts, the first of which is a dictionary. A dictionary is essentially a collection of data that holds a key value pair. So the key is usually the word, while the values are the definition. So these keys cannot be repeated in a dictionary. Similar to how an actual dictionary, you can't have the same word defined, right? You always have different unique words. Similarly, keys in a dictionary cannot be repeated. However, different keys can share the same value. So for instance, it's kind of similar to how two synonyms in a dictionary can have the same meaning, essentially. Similarly, you could think of keys as being able to have the same value. Now, please bear in mind two things. One, keys are actually immutable. Once you initialize a key, you cannot change it. And the second thing is that values are mutable. You can actually change, um, you can actually change the value that a key is associated with. And dictionaries are data structures that store data. Um, so if you wanted to store a key value pair of some sort, then it would be useful to use a dictionary. If you wanted to just store like a list of numbers, you can use a list or array. Um, but they're all in this bigger realm called data structures. And we're going to be using the dictionary data structure very extensively in this bot Twitter webinar. Next, I'm going to go over data frames. So data frames come from the Pandas library. And these data frames, you can think of them as a 2D array. So actually, you have rows and you have columns. And these data frames have two axes. Um, they have an x-axis for rows and a y-axis for columns. Now, if you see in the example here, this data frame actually holds data about basketball players on the Boston Celtics. And it's very, very similar to a table or a chart that you would see. So I'm actually getting a question in the chat from John here. Um, thanks for the question, John. I'll go, I'll go answer it real quick. Essentially, um, he asks, what is the Pandas library? The pandas library is actually a really, really powerful library that's unique to Python. Essentially, what it lets you do is it lets you um, initialize um, these data structures called data frames. And there's actually there's also arrays that you can actually make special kinds of arrays with pandas. And it allows you to manipulate data and conduct data analysis really, really easily. Um, traditionally, you would have to use a 2D array to store data like in a data frame, as you can see. The data frame is like a table in 2D array essentially also stores a table, but manipulating a 2D array in Python is much more cumbersome than actually manipulating a data frame, for instance. So coming from the pandas library, it's a very, very powerful tool. And you guys will be using it a lot in um, your, data analysis, your, your data analysis classes um, or workshops by Bit Project, or um, just in your, if you're pursuing a data science career, it's really, really cool. So thanks for the question. So now I'm going to move on to the next slide here. I'm going to briefly talk about this file format called JSON. JSON files are basically an open standard file format or data interchange format that uses human readable text to transmit data objects. Um, essentially, in plain English, what that means is that it stores data in a structured manner. So you guys can see on the right side that this is an example of a JSON object. As you can see, there's a lot of curly braces and a lot of attributes, a lot of colons. Essentially, you could think of these JSONs as really elaborate dictionaries, right? Uh, you can see that there's like keys. The first key of this dictionary is labeled quiz. And then the value of that um, 
the value that's attributed to that key quiz is actually another dictionary. Um, because you can see that the dictionaries, if you guys don't know, they're denoted by curly braces. So you can have dictionaries inside of dictionaries in JSON. And in fact, that's the fundamentals of JSON is that the fundamental structure behind JSON is that it's essentially nested dictionary. So you can store a lot of data in a very, very efficient manner using JSON. And we're going to learn more about how JSON works and how to apply it in the next upcoming slides. But I just want to give you guys a quick intro on JSON before I move on. Do you have any questions about JSON? I want to make sure I cover all bases here. OK, I'm not getting anything in the chat, so I'm going to move on. Cool. So now we're going to learn how to make a data frame for this activity. Um, please make sure you open a new file to write in before we move on. Um, and basically, what we're going to start off with is gathering data from Twitter. So you should insert this code. Um, I'll give you guys about, uh, since you, got, you guys should open up the slides on your own and copy and paste this code, I'll give you guys about 10, 15 seconds to do that. In the meantime, if you guys have any questions, feel free to leave them in the chat. Oh yeah, so I'm getting getting some questions about the code itself. I'll explain the code in the next slide. Just insert this code for now. Okay, cool. So now what does that code actually mean? It essentially sets up your entire connection to your Twitter API. Now your Twitter API is going to be how you get data from Twitter, get tweets from Twitter, and so you can actually um, detect the tweets and see whether of a user and see whether um, you can see whether the based on the tweet content that the bot that the user is a bot or not. And so this slide or the previous slide, I mean, so all this code on this slide here basically lets you actually connect to the Twitter API. Um, we're not going to go into the semantics of like the streaming API. The most important thing is that this code here lets us authenticate an easy uh, and um, painless connection to Twitter API. So if you guys remembered in the last slide, there is a track list and you can see there's hashtag one, hashtag two, hashtag three right here on the bottom. You can replace those hashtags with whatever, whatever hashtags you want to put in there. Whatever you're interested in when it comes to Twitter, you guys can put in whatever hashtags you want to investigate further. And then what we're going to do after you guys um, edit those hashtags is we're going to run that code and we're going to pipe its output to a txt file in this manner. Um, so if you leave it running for a while, you have your data to be analyzed. So that's really, really exciting. Any questions on this slide? I know it's a lot of, it's quite high level. So a little bit of content here. Oh yeah, okay. I'm getting a question from Mike. Uh, Mike says, what does piping actually mean? Um, so if you guys aren't familiar with command line, I, I, I see that maybe not all of you are, so I'll go over what piping is real quick. Essentially, piping allows you to redirect files. So you can run, um, you can actually like send contents of one file and redirect them to another file. And that's exactly what this um, piping command is doing. It's taking the contents from Twitter, downloader py, and transmitting it to Twitter data txt. So if you guys run that in terminal, and on, on, on Mac it's terminal, on Windows it's command prompt, you guys run that statement, it should work. And if you guys have questions, anyone have questions about terminal command prompt or anything on this slide? Cool. Yeah, I'm going to move on. So now that we have our Twitter connection set up, we're going to move on to importing libraries. So let's import these following libraries at the top of your file. We have, we have um, three very important libraries in pandas, numpy, and matplotlib. These three libraries are going to be the fundamental libraries to the Twitter workshops that you guys will be attending, as well as any sort of data analysis classes that you guys will be taking. Um, if you guys are going to be interested in like machine learning, natural language processing, data science, essentially you're going to be using these, um, you're going to be using these libraries all the time. I talked about pandas briefly before. Pandas is basically a really useful library which you can use to um, initialize data structures that should manipulate data and analyze data really, really quickly. Once you get further into data science, you'll realize that linear algebra is really, really important. And so NumPy will really come in handy when you're dealing with array and matrix mathematics. 
Um, and we're going to introduce you to a little bit of NumPy today. Lastly, matplotlib is probably my favorite library in this um, list of three here. Um, it allows you to plot graphs. And it basically lets you see it's really, really strong. It's a really, really strong um, graphing tool. And it also lets you see um, your results happening in real in a real graphic so you're doing all this code you're doing all this math and not everyone will understand all that code understand all that math but everyone can understand an accessible graph and so this this library really is really amazing because it lets you put all of your you, you have you put all your hard work into code um, and then you put it all in a graph for everyone to understand and you just like your hard work paid off so matplotlib is really really cool and you guys will be using it a lot cool um, we're going to move on to another code part. So if you guys should, can open the slides up again and add this code into your file, that would be awesome. I'll give you guys a few seconds to do that. Could I get a thumbs up in the chat if you guys are done with this part here? OK, cool. Everyone's good. Let's move on. Now, that was a lot of code. So I'm going to break down what it actually means here. Basically, this code reads the data that we have collected and processed it. Now, remember I talked about JSONs earlier, right? The output of these APIs that of Twitter and it's the streaming API, by the way, is part of the Twitter API, just to clarify. But we're specifically using the streaming API in this project. Essentially, what we're doing is um, we're taking an output from the streaming API, which is always a JSON object. And JSON objects have many fields that can provide useful information. So we want to keep that object. Right? So what we're doing now, after we get that object into our code, is we're actually going to use this um, wrapper called Tweepy. It's, we're going to read the raw data the raw JSON collected from the Twitter streaming. And we're actually going to perform some operations on it. Um, so what we're going to do now is we're going to replace, if you guys saw in the last slide here, let me go back. Um, you saw this tweets data path, Brexit tweets one underscore TXT. So you should replace that with your own TXT file, because not everyone will have this text file here. We just set that path up um, as a dummy path. Essentially, you should make your own TXT file and set that path accordingly. Um, so if you're using, if you're a fan of terminal, um, you can save and exit your file to the command line. You can enter touch your file name.txt, and the name is up to you. Then you can replace it in your code. Basically, you just need to make sure you're making a file. You don't have to do it in terminal. I know terminal can be quite scary for a lot of people. So if you don't want to use Terminal, you can just open up your favorite code editor, um, either on Mac, Windows, Linux. They all have default code editors. Just make a new file um, in the directory that you're working in. Make sure it's a text file, and then replace the code accordingly. Anyone else have questions about this code here? Oh, yeah. Um, that's a good question. Let me think about that for a moment. OK. Um, so Adrian asked a really good question about the list comprehension you guys see at the bottom of the slide. Um, as you can see, there's a very complicated expression here, um, x for x and tweets data. Basically, this is a form of list comprehension in Python. What it allows you to do is make for loops that initialize arrays, but you don't have to type out, you don't have to make it all a new line. So traditionally, this would this for loop will be written like for x in tweets data colon, and then you have to have a new line. And then if not is, in, is, in, is, is instance x int, you have to check for that condition on the second line. And on the third line, you actually um, return x, right? You actually like append it to an array. Well, Python does all that nasty work for you in this whole list comprehension right here. Basically checks um, if it's not an instance. And if it's not an instance, that, is, that x value is added to the array of tweets data. And if not, it doesn't matter. So Python allows you to do really powerful things like list comprehensions um, that other languages don't let you do. So if you're coming from more of a C, C++, Java background, this sort of list comprehension would be hard for you to understand at first. Um, 
but don't worry, you guys will get more used to it as you guys work on more Twitter workshops. Great, so I'm gonna move on here. Now we have um, some more code. So this is the source field. Um, essentially, you guys can just take a look and read that. It's pretty um, repetitive code. So if anyone can, um, if anyone is brave to tell me what this code actually does, you guys can type it in the chat and I can give you guys some feedback. So I'll give you guys a second to do that. Okay, I, I'm seeing some great answers. And you guys are basically hitting on the head, um, which is great. Basically, what will happen is this code takes the source field of the, every single tweet, and it's going to actually find, figure out what the source actually is. So you can see it's very repetitive. It basically just checks whether the text is inside of the tweet source. So the source is a, is a um, the source is a field that contains the, the, the source of the tweet. However, it's not, um, it's not really like, really like we want to process it in a certain fashion here. So for in this case, we want to process certain devices like iPhone, Android, mobile device. And you can do that by just checking a bunch of ELIFs. Um, especially for the second case or the third case, you guys see the second ELIF statement, ELIF mobile in tweet source or app in tweet source. We want to account for both cases, right? Because if it's mobile or app, then they're both from a mobile device. And um, the tweet, Twitter API doesn't make that distinction. So that's why we have to write all these test cases out. Yeah, well, basically, I explained this slide already. Um, so we wanted to basically unify and standardize all of those, all of the outputs that the Twitter API gives. OK, so now let's get to the fun stuff here. Um, we're actually going to make a data frame. So we're going to add the following statement here. Basically, this line in a nutshell, I know it's a quite a gnarly line, but I will try to break it down for you guys. So this line will get the names of the users who are active on Twitter. Okay. So basically, you guys can see that there's a lambda function. If you guys aren't familiar with lambda functions, they're basically inline functions. So they, if you can think of that function literally just defined there as um, taking in a tweet object and then returning the user, returning the screen name of that tweet. And then what, it do, what the map function does is it takes that function and it applies it to all of the data in tweets data, every single element. Okay, and then the list um, keyword on the outside is just a uh, typecaster. Basically, it just changes the type to list. So, they, so you have a map um, output, which isn't necessarily a list, but we do want a list um, for later purposes. So we just put a typecast list on the outside. Hopefully that makes sense. I know it's quite gnarly, especially if you haven't dealt with lambda functions before. You can think of lambda functions as inline functions, basically. So I'll let you guys read that. Let that simmer in your brain for a little bit before I move on. So real quick, um, to clarify, this code only initializes one column of a data frame. It's the username column. So if you want to actually um, initialize all the other columns, you're going to have to do a bit more work. This is just for the, we just gave, we're giving one example here of the username. So please make sure that, um, so if you guys add in other information, you guys will see that it looks, the data frame should look like this. So we'll start um, with the data frame setup. Now let's start um, working with the data. So. We'll start off by taking our data frame. Um, in this case, I called it tweets. You guys can call it whatever you want in your code, but I called it tweets. And we took the username attribute and we find the number of unique users using the function n unique. Okay. So now it, what it should output, it should output something like there are x different users on your terminal. Um, so now let's move on to user activity. Basically, these user tweets. Um, what you would do is you want to group by username. Okay, so what a group by function does is it splits the data into groups. It lets you um, see the see how many elements share a certain um, element, and essentially all of this information is assigned to user tweets. 
Any questions? Okay. Um, yeah, so Brian had a, Brian has a good question about group by. Um, I'll just clarify what group by real quick is for everybody. Group by essentially lets you group by essentially just lets you um, it's the name is pretty literal. It lets you group by certain elements. So let's just say I have um, let me try to think of an example here. Let's just say I have a company, right? And I have a lot of roles. Okay, I have manager, I have worker, um, I have, well, let's just split it up a bit more. I have project managers, I have executives, and I have workers. Let's just say we have those three roles. And if we want to group by, um, those, so those, are, those are all like possible values of a column called rule, let's just say. Okay. And what happens is, let's just say we want to group by that rule. Well, it's literally going to find all of the people who have who are um, workers, group them all together. It's going to find all the people who are executives, group them all together. And it's going to find all the project managers, they'll group them all together. And you'll see in the data frame, they'll actually, the rows are actually going to be moved around so that um, all the people with the same role are actually in the same area. So you guys will see like one blob of workers, one, then one blob of project managers, then one blob of executives, right? And then with the group by function, you can actually do really powerful things. For example, you can find all of the, you can find a total number of workers, right? Or the total number of ex executives. If you have a column keeping track of the salary, for instance, you can find the average salary of all the workers or all the executives or all of the, um, all the project managers, right? So it's a really, really powerful tool, this group by instance. In this case, we're grouping by username. So everyone who has the same username is going to clump together. They're going to be in their own group. So here's an example of before and after using group by. So we decided in this case to group by, um, I'm sorry, there's a mistake on the slides actually. Um, the before and after pictures should be switched. Sorry about that, but basically um, what you see is on the right side, you have, this, um, you have this data frame of players or random players, right? So look at the, sorry guys, just look at the right picture as the before and the left side as the after. Essentially, um, before you actually finish, before you do group by, it's just all, they're all like scrambled, right? And after you do group by, you see all the Boston Celtics players are grouped together. And then there's one Brooklyn Nets player at the bottom. So that means the Brooklyn Nets group is starting there. Okay. So basically you can see that all of the, the, the ones with Boston are clumped together just like that. Now, due to the large number of users we have, the users who have more activity is more important for us in this case. So let's just say we only want to see the top 25 people. Um, so let's add the following to your code. Now let's explain what that code means. Essentially, the previous code will take the top 25 most active users and they'll put them into a dictionary. And then we're actually going to sort all those items in a dictionary using the sorted function. And just real quick, the sorted function is a function in the Python library that will return a copy of the original sequence in the sorted order. Um, we're also going to set the key argument to, lam to a lambda function, which will basically sort the value of each item based on the value of the key. So now we're going to start uh, working with the dictionary. We're going to start making lists out of our dictionary. So we're going to make two lists, one for the keys, one for the values. So we're using this information separately because we want to make it easier to plot later. Um, basically, this code is pretty simple. It loops through the dictionary of data from zero, index zero to index 25. When it's looping, it'll add users from the dict keys list and values, the first index of the item from the dict values list. Um, so a list, remember, is a collection that is indexed. It allows repeating items. And it's very, very similar to a race. Very intuitive, a list. So if you guys can take a look at the code here, it's basically a bunch of code to plot um, user activity. And there's, there's pretty standard stuff like you can set an X label, or in this case, an X axis label, a Y axis label. You can set X ticks. So map, this is using matplotlib and it's really, really powerful. You can customize a lot of things with, with the graphs and the graphs look really great if you put in a lot of work into it. Essentially, what we're going to do here is 
we're going to print out the graph. That's basically what we're going to do with all of the constraints that we define in this code here. So we can we have, for example, we have font size of 18 for the um, X label, font size of 20 for the Y label, et cetera, et cetera. So if you run your program, this is just a sample run, so you're not going to have the same thing here. But we can see that this username for our sample run here, we had this username Crito Kaku, and they were very, very active. They had a lot of activity. That's very suspicious because they um, outpaced the next user by a lot. By almost this is this is like the most active users on Twitter. They outpaced them by almost 25, 30 percent. So we're going to see if we if he or she is a bot. We we'll use Batometer to help us find out. Now, Batometer is a website that basically uh, gives a, if you get, you're given a username, it'll return a possibility of a user being a bot. Um, and that's activity. We're not going to go into how to use the API. That'll be very useful later on, how to use it with Botometer API. Um, so, we're, you're, so you're welcome to learn it. Um, but for now, we're just going to use the website. So whatever data you've got so far, you just enter the top most active user's username. So it won't, for you, it most likely won't be Kaku type in whatever username you do have as the most active, and then click on check user. As you can see, um, this is just a sample run. Otometer will give you a percentage of how likely this account is actually a bot. And the results will basically look like this. Um, as you can see in the example, the, the account TD, TD data, T data science, it's not likely a bot, they have the green banner, while CAG Europe has a high chance of being a bot. So yeah. That's pretty much it. Thank you guys for coming. And you guys should know how to detect bots on Twitter um, and use the Twitter API to do so and a little, learn a little bit about Pandas, NumPy, and Matplotlib in the process. Um, I'll be sticking around if you have any questions, but thank you for your time and have a good rest of your day.